Ms. Gordon, before we start talking about your father, I'd like to discuss your early life a bit so that we have some context. Could you please tell me a little bit about when and where you were born? I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and uh, it was in 1938, and my father worked for the Associated Press in Philadelphia, so he'd take the train from Wayne, Pennsylvania into Philadelphia to go to work. And uh, we lived there for three or four years. I have an older brother who remembers more about it than I do, and we went back there, my brother and I went back to see the houses in Wayne, the two houses where we used to live. And that was five or six years ago we went back just to reminisce. And uh, I think that's about it. I was quite young, so I don't really remember Philadelphia. What, what about your siblings? When they were born, and, and where was your father, or excuse me, family living at the time? Uh, my uh, parents, uh, they lived in New York City when my older brother was born, and his name is Ranny Johnson Miller, and uh, his maternal grandmother's maiden name was Ranny, and then Johnson comes from my mother's maiden name. She was uh, Louise Johnson. And uh, Rand was born December 12, 1934, in New York City. And then my two younger brothers were born in Washington, D.C. And uh, let's see, what else would you like to know about them? Would you want their birth dates or would you just like to know their names? What? One thing I would be interested in is how did the order of your births uh, influence your relationships with your brothers, or did it? Mm -hmm. The order of the births made it so that we had like two families because my younger brothers were seven and eight years younger than I am, and there was a span of ten years between my older brother and my youngest brother. And uh, so it was like two families. I helped take care of my younger brothers. If my parents were going out to dinner, uh, lots of times I would fix the dinner and make sure they went to bed. <laughs> and so um, it was. It just seemed like it was two separate families. That's interesting. In fact, that leads right into the next question. Um, did, did the age differences, did that make a difference in how the older and younger siblings saw things? Um, not really, because I, I'm i closer to my brothers now than I was back then. They went away, my two younger brothers went to a prep school where, uh, uh, well, it's hard to explain, but there was a Trinity School in New York City, and then Trinity Pauling School was started after Trinity School was. And my mother knew about Trinity School when she lived when we lived in New York City, and so uh, she chose, along with the rest of the family, she went to Trinity Pauling School and liked it. And my two younger brothers went there to school. So um, no, I don't think that. I think we all think pretty much alike still. I don't think there are a lot of differences there. How interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you think your younger brothers had a different experience of your father's career than you and your older brother did just because of this timing? Definitely. Um, we were more in on the action when Dad was, uh, uh, he was the chief of bureau of the Associated Press in Washington and a lot of people came to our house and um, we got to know people very well and uh, friends of my parents and and we lived in a great neighborhood and my actually my older brother uh, he was responsible for neighborhood parades like the 4th of July parade so we'd get all the uh, we bikes would be decorated and all that kind of thing and there'd be a parade in Spring Valley which is a suburb of Washington and then when we moved to Rochester, New York, we moved out in the country and my mother had to drive us to a friend's house to get the friend and bring the friend back or, uh, or that friend's mother would drive somebody. 
And so it was not the same thing. We really preferred Washington to living in Pittsburgh, New York, outside of Rochester. We had a big house, and um, it was on 24 acres. They bought 24 acres, and the house had not been lived in for three years. Miss Gordon, what are uh, some of your strongest memories from those homes, from those places? I thought it was much more informal when we lived in Washington. We just uh, got to know a lot of people and felt very comfortable there. It seemed more formal when we moved to Rochester and uh, we were in a big house and my mother had help that she had to have live-in help because my two younger brothers were only one and two years old when we moved to Rochester and she had to go with my father to dinners, etc. And uh, so we did have the help and and most of my friends didn't have a big house with help, so it was a, it was, um, it was just not as comfortable as Washington. We were all we had neighbors that had homes similar to our homes, and we became good friends with them. And I even there was even a doctor that lived next door in Washington, who sewed up my leg one night because. I rode my scooter into the into my uh, uh, garage, and I ripped open my knee on my father's bumper, on the rear bumper, and and so um, the doctor who lives next door, Doctor Caulfield, came over and sewed up my knee right there. I mean, I didn't have any medication or anything. I just had to deal with it, and and I don't remember that it hurt that much either, which is kind of surprising because I remember sitting in a chair in the den. And uh, so it was just, uh, it was more formal in, in Rochester and um, it, it just was so different uh, that I liked, I liked Washington better. I was nine when we moved. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Could you briefly chart your family's moves uh, both while you were growing up and then later, just so we have a sense of what of where your parents were when. Uh huh. Uh, you mean the from what I remember, the move from Washington to Rochester, and then we moved in 1947 to Rochester, and then when I was 18, I went to college, and I came back uh, after I went to a junior college. I went to University of Geneva for a semester in Switzerland and came home and I taught preschool uh, for one year in Rochester and lived at home. And then I left home and went to Columbus, Ohio, where my grandparents, my mother's parents, lived. And I worked at Ohio State University in the law library for two and a half years. And I lived with them for a year, and then I, I did find an apartment near Ohio State. And, and my mother was a graduate of Ohio State. And uh, that was meaningful living in uh, Columbus because my parents met in Columbus. And Dad worked, that was Dad's first job with the Associated Press, and he was in the same building as the Ohio State Journal. And my mother worked for the journal, so he saw her on the elevator, and uh, he apparently gave, I think he left a note on her desk and asked her, uh, will the, uh, will the uh, lady who, I, I can't remember exactly how it was worded, you might even have it uh, in your archives, and he did ask her in a note to go out, like, uh, well, the editor of Ann Sessions, she, she wrote a, an advice to the lovelorn, Ann Sessions was her name, her pen name, I guess you call it. And she had taken over for a friend who was getting married, and it was right after she graduated from Ohio State. And so she didn't even know she was going to be doing that kind of a job, but she had a good friend who needed somebody to take over the job. And so uh, she became Ann Sessions, and, and my father asked her out on a date, and he signed it from an AP man or something like that. And uh, so uh, apparently she was engaged, but I never heard about 
who it was. I suppose it was somebody she met in college. So that was all over with because they met and within a few months they were married. They were married during the Depression, so they had what you call an open wedding uh, where anybody can come to the church and they didn't have to spend money on wedding invitations and uh, they were members. My grandparents were members of the Broad Street Presbyterian Church and so they had relatives, a lot of relatives, and they came, and I'm sure friends also came to the wedding. But my mother didn't have bridesmaids like they did at a lot of weddings just because of finances. And, uh, and I do have a picture of her uh, with her wedding dress on. She did have a, a pretty dress. And then my dad gave my mother a wedding band that it was a small band with diamonds, I have it, and uh, uh, so she didn't have an engagement ring, she just had that, and he had just started out with the Associated Press, and I know they had an apartment on Broad Street, which was the main street in Columbus, and uh, they had one of those Murphy beds that goes up into the wall, and I, the first time I saw a Murphy bed was in a movie a long time ago, and it was like a Bob Hope movie where the... <laughs> A bed just disappeared in the wall with Bob Hope in it or something like that, something crazy. So I always thought it was funny that they had a Murphy bed. Apparently they still make them, but I sure haven't seen one in a long time. But I think I'm off the track, so you can, you go ahead. Well, getting back to when you uh, were younger then, yeah. what was an average day like in your house? Um, when we lived in Washington, we also had help in Washington. <laughs> But there were neighbors who had help, so we all felt equal there, whereas in Rochester, the neighbors didn't have help. We had a butler named Jesse, and he would bring our breakfast into the dining room, and uh, he was a character because he, he lived on the third floor. He lived in our house, and uh, I mean, this was part of our life, and there was a butler next door because we had a U.S. senator living next door, and that butler also was a chauffeur and drove uh, Senator Maybank from uh, South Carolina to work every day. And we shared the driveway with the Maybanks. And so anyway, these two men were friends. And um, what was I going to say about that? Um, well, I shouldn't talk too much about them, but they were both characters, and I do have stories about them. I would say that... Um, we, had, we went to school on the school bus. We went to Horace Mann Public School, and uh, we had a pretty normal life. Dad came home for dinner, and if my parents were going out, then uh, he would come home and change his clothes, and, and my mother would go with him, and they'd go out to a party or to various functions because Washington is a big, <laughs> it was a big place for parties. Uh, they went to embassies to parties and I think because of Dad's position that he was often asked to go and it was, I, I think he thought it was partly his job to do it, you know. And uh, so he, he loved his work and they always read newspapers at night. And he'd bring home newspapers, and after dinner, they'd sit together and read newspapers. And that went on in, in Washington and Rochester. I remember that very well, that she would read everything. <laughs> they'd go, you know, start from the beginning of the paper. And, and the, I know they had the New York Times in Rochester. And, uh, and so they, they'd read that along with the local newspapers. And... Uh, we just, we had a normal life. We said grace at dinner because my father's father was a minister, not just because of that, but um, we, that was a, a habit and we went to church together on Sunday to a Methodist church and, um, and dad was very strict about us going to church and be, being a minister's son, I think that, uh, that made him feel that, uh, that it was the right thing to do for our family. So we, whether we wanted to go or not, even as teenagers when we were older, we went to church. And uh, 
So uh, I'd, I'd say we had a pretty normal family life. Uh, where did you go to school? And I went to, um, in Washington, when we lived in a townhouse to start with in downtown Washington. And I did go to a private school and uh, Dad, I remember Dad used to walk me to kindergarten at Holton Arms in Washington. And, um, and then we lived there a few years and then we moved to Spring Valley where there are a lot of senators. There was one, Senator Lister Hill was across the street and my brother, uh, he was the age of Senator Hill's son so they would get together and do things. And uh, uh, let's see what else. Uh, uh, you wanted to know where I went to school. So I, I went to Horace Mann School when we moved to Spring Valley because it was the closest school and we would take the bus. And then I went to Pittsford Central School when we moved to Pittsford, New York. And then when I was in high school, I went to a girls' school in Rochester and it was called Columbia School. And I think that was my mother's influence because she went to a girl's school for high school in Columbus, Ohio called Columbus School for Girls. And so uh, she was the one who promoted private schools and, and uh, my older brother went away to school and, and my two younger brothers went away. Uh, and actually my son ended up going to Trinity Pauling School where my younger brothers went to school. And that's very unusual if you live in Colorado to go off east to a prep school, but uh, it was the right thing to do. And, and Paul, I'm very proud of Paul, so it has worked out well, my son Paul. And uh, so I, I, okay, so I went to, uh, I graduated from Columbia School and I went to Pine Manor, which is a junior college in Boston. It's now a four-year college, it was a women's college. And then I went to the University of Geneva in Switzerland for one semester, and that was really to improve the French language. I just took courses to improve my French. And I did hang around with a couple of German girls, and we spoke English quite a bit. <laughs> but we, we all did learn French. They were learn, there to learn French also. And, uh, and then when I came back, um, I... I took some courses at Ohio State University, and I never did get a degree. I never uh, finished, but I did take some courses at Ohio State, and I, that was after, that was actually after I worked in the law library. I worked in the law library two and a half years, and then I took some courses there at Ohio State. So that was my education. What influence did your parents have on these decisions to go to these different uh, colleges? Uh, they, uh, I think that, that they were fine with everything I did. I don't think there was any problem. And, and uh, my mother was happy I was going to Ohio State because she had gone there and her sister also was a graduate of Ohio State. What did you do right after college? And after college, I taught, uh, I was an elementary, no, I was a preschool teacher, not an elementary school teacher, and that was just for one year. And that was in Rochester, and then I moved to Columbus, Ohio right after that. Could you give me a brief synopsis of what you've done since? And... Uh, I went to New York City. I had a boyfriend in New York City, so I left Columbus. And I worked in New York City for an interior decorating firm. And that was a receptionist type job. And I was there for three years. And uh, I worked one of those old switchboards where you plug it in, you know. And there were 15 decorators there. And uh, so I had to, if they had a, if there was a call coming in, I had to, Whoever, if somebody was calling, uh, I'd have to connect the call with uh, each of the decorators. There were some men and women also, uh, about half and half, and we had a good time there. And um, and that was in a townhouse. It was called Thedlow, 
and um, so that was a decorating firm and um, I did work for a book publishing company but I didn't like the job in New York City and uh, so I ended up just working as a receptionist because the book publishing company <laughs> they had no windows and it was kind of boring there so I ended up there at, uh, at Bedlow it was called and uh, and then I moved here, uh, I moved to Denver, and uh, I didn't move here until I was married, and I never worked again. I had a son a year after I was married, and I had a daughter, uh, and uh, she came th three years after Paul was born, my daughter Pamela was born. And, and most of the people on the street in Golden where we lived outside of Denver most of the mothers stayed home back then. It was it's different now, of course, but the mothers stayed home, and so that was what I did. And I did get involved with volunteer work, and uh, I've always been involved with a lot of organizations, but I never have had a a paying job uh, since I uh, lived in uh, in New York City, and that was my my last job. Now I'd like to talk a little bit more about your father and your mother as well to fill in some of the gaps we have in our archival record. First, I'm wondering what your earliest memory of your father was. Uh, I think it was uh, he walked me to, to school. I'm wondering what your earliest memory of your mother was. Uh, she was a good mother and a good wife and uh, uh, she uh, liked to cook, and uh, she didn't like to shop that much, and I think it was because her father uh, lost money during the Depression, and she was very careful about spending money. And <laughs> we always kidded her, even when she was older, about that, and that she was frugal. And uh, so that's what I remember most about her. Your father was raised in an apparently stable family with traditional Christian values. How much did he believe that his upbringing contributed to his success as an adult? I think that he thought that, that everybody uh, who wanted to be successful should have religion and be a good person and not lie or cheat or anything like that. I think that was the way he felt. How, mu how much do you believe that it did? I think that definitely because he was honest and upfront about everything, uh, I think it helped him a lot. What stories did he tell you about his time growing up? He, <laughs> well, he would lie because he said that he walked through the snow uh, a couple of miles to go to school, and we know that it doesn't snow in Oklahoma. And uh, he also said he was one-eighth Chippewa. And um, according to one of my aunts, there was an Indian in their ancestry. But it's hard to trace the Indian ancestry, and, and we've never done that. And, uh, and anyway, he used to make a joke out of it. It bothered my mother if he said he was one-eighth Chippewa. And uh, she would say, oh, no, you're not, Paul. And so I think he just liked to tease her sometimes because he would say that, make that phrase quite a bit. And, uh, and it often followed him saying that he was from Oklahoma, you know, and he would, that would often come after that. And, um, and then um, I looked into the Cree Indians because apparently we do have a Cree Indian ancestor, but I haven't done enough research, and uh, so it, it's probably true. And and I don't know, um, you know, I I just don't have information. I know that my older brother said that uh, that my father and my grandfather went to Michigan, and they brought back a gift that an Indian boy gave to my brother, my older brother. And uh, 
And he thought that it was Chippewa. Ran, my older brother, thinks that, that there really was a, a Chippewa Indian ancestor. But I know that Cree Indians live in Michigan and in Canada. They're right above Michigan and Canada, there are Cree Indian reservations. So uh, we've just talked about it, and and I uh, I'd like to find out more, but I just haven't. Your father seems always to have known that he wanted to become a journalist. Do you know if that's true? In other words, did he ever talk about envisioning doing anything else professionally with his life? No, he always, uh, I think from the start, uh, when he worked on a newspaper as a student, that uh, that was what he always wanted to do. Your father's papers indicate that the Depression was a rough time for his family financially. How much of an influence do you think the Depression had on his financial ambitions? Well, um, in Washington, I know we had to eat everything on our plates because it was during the war. And um, I really, um, I don't know about the Depression, how much of an effect it had on him. I just know that my mother was affected because her parents were doing very well. And my, fa my grandfather had money in real estate. And, Real estate wasn't any good during the Depression. So they just, they had to change their lifestyle completely. And uh, with my father, he, um, he talked about how they ate so much chicken uh, when he was growing up because it was cheap and there was, they had a big family. There were, uh, there were six children and a minister's family is not well to do. They struggle. And so he never wanted chicken after that, after he grew up and was married, he avoided eating chicken. And uh, so I think that the Depression, in a, fa in a way, I think Dad felt he grew up during the Depression, but I think that, that a minister's family always struggles. And my mother had to, they really changed their lifestyle, and my dad's lifestyle was pretty much the same all the time that he was growing up. And then when he had a, a job and, and lived in uh, Columbus, I don't remember them saying that they had a hard time after they were married. I don't, I never, I don't think they ever had any struggle after that. I don't, I, he never talked about the Depression, really. You already mentioned uh, how your uh, parents met uh, during his first job in, with the AP in, in Columbus. Uh, did they ever tell you stories about their early years together? Not that much, really. Uh, my, my mother did have a baby who died in New York City in a hospital there, and the baby was normal, but... Uh, there was uh, some illness that went around and other babies in the nursery also died and they used to keep babies in the hospital longer then and that was her first child. So uh, uh, then, uh, no, I, they didn't, I don't remember, I, I remember that, but I don't remember them talking that much about uh, their first, the few, first few years they were married. Well, they did move around a lot, and I should tell you that my older brother uh, moved like 12 times, and, uh, and then I had the more stable life because I was born in Philadelphia, and we lived on Long Island, and, and uh, we lived in New York City, and then Washington and then Rochester, but my when my father was the with the Associated Press, they lived in Kansas City and Salt Lake City, and so they moved around quite a bit. And uh, I do remember them talking about all the moves and and like it. I think it was exciting, but it was also hard on the family. What did you know about your father's job when you were growing up? I just knew that he loved uh, he loved being a reporter, and 
So um, that was that was it for him. And then he enjoyed meeting people and writing stories and making sure that the spelling was right and the punctuation was right. He was very much a perfectionist and he would have us write letters. I remember in, in Pittsburgh, New York, he'd have my older brother and I write letters to relatives and he would check them and then if we had mistakes he would correct them and we'd have to rewrite the letters and uh, and so uh, that part was, it was good, but I think it made me a perfectionist because I tend to, to read and see if there are mistakes. And I think I picked that up from him. How would you describe what, what you thought he did at work? Um, how would I describe what he did at work? What, what you thought at the time, what, when you were young, what, what you thought he did at work. Uh -huh. I, I think he would go out and get news stories in Washington and uh, meet famous people. And he told us that he had breakfast with President Roosevelt one, one day and one morning. And, and that the Scotty, President Roosevelt Scotty was under the table. And uh, so he was excited about having breakfast with the president. And, and my two younger brothers were too young then, but my older brother and I were very impressed. And then when President Roosevelt died, it was on the radio. We didn't have TV. And uh, I, I do remember hearing that and how sad it was. For everybody. How much travel did his work involve when you were little? Uh, when I was little, I don't think he traveled that much. And uh, when I was nine, we moved to Rochester and they had Gannett Company airplanes and he would go and visit newspapers that were part of the Gannett chain. So he did a lot of traveling. He often would take his uh, golf clubs on the plane and then if if they were interested in buying a newspaper often the owner of the newspaper played golf and they'd go out and play golf and sometimes he'd make a deal on the golf course. What activities was your mother involved with when you were growing up? Uh, she really was busy just being a wife and mother and running the house and uh, uh, she didn't even belong to a bridge group till uh, the chil all of us were grown. And so I, I don't think she really had that many social activities. She did belong to a women's club in Rochester. And it was called the Chatterbox Club. And I know that she gave a talk there about uh, the Associated Press. And I wish I had a, a copy because she talked about, and I, I was not there, I was not living there, but uh, she talked about the AP, and she said, and it, it's not the A and P, but it's the Associated Press, because when we lived in Washington, we went to the A and P store, we did our shopping there. And uh, I could go back a little bit about uh, during the war, when we lived in Washington, um, I do remember that nylon stockings, women like to buy nylon stockings, and we went to a store when they put nylon stockings on a counter and all these women rushed for them at once. It was like one of those sales, you know, where they all just scrambled to get nylon stockings. And, uh, but no, I, there, there never was that much talk about the depression except that I think that my grandparents avoided talking about it because it was a, a rough time for them, for him, for my grandfather, who was also an attorney in addition to owning real estate, uh, my mother's father. Uh, I think that, you know, they, I mean, after there was a recovery later, you know, and they just didn't like to talk about hard times. So that's why I can't tell you that much about the depression. 
You, think, you've already mentioned that she was an editor when your parents first met. Did she ever go back to that work at all? No, uh, she never did. As you mentioned before, you had the opportunity to move a lot. Uh, do you think your mother enjoyed the variety? I think it was hard um, to, to go to new places with children, with the family. It wasn't like in the Army. If you joined the Army, you... Um, I think they, it's a closer relationship with other people that are in the Army, and so it, it's harder if you go to a strange city, and you have to go to strange schools, and I think it's a big adjustment. I think it's different. Which place do you think she liked the best? Washington. From 1941 to 1945, your father was one of several privileged Washington correspondents included in a series of confidential briefings held by General George Marshall and Admiral Ernest King. Are you aware of what his opinions were of General Marshall and Admiral King, both personally and professionally? No, I, I am not aware of that. But I think he did call General Marshall George. I think they were in... First, na uh, first name basis. Your father never served as a war correspondent. Uh, obviously that did not adversely affect his later career in journalism, but do you think he regretted not having done so on a personal level? Would you repeat that? Uh, sure. Your father never served as a war correspondent overseas, and it did not affect his later journalism career. He rose very rapidly, both in the Associated Press and in Gannett. But do you think he regretted not having done so on a personal level? Uh, no, he never said that he regretted it. Your father's papers indicate that he and Kent Cooper had a very close working relationship until around 1947 when he moved to Gannett. Do you have any idea if that affected their relationship and, or friendship? They were good friends, and uh, uh, I would say the rest of Mr. and Mrs. Cooper's lives, my parents were their friends, and I was a friend of Mrs. Cooper's when I lived and worked in New York City, and she was a widow, and we did see each other, and so it was almost like they were part of her family. It was a very good relationship. Did your father talk about his relationship with Kent Cooper? Uh, he uh, always looked up to him, and um, I think they thought a lot of him, and yeah, like he was a, a mentor. Do, do you ever remember meeting Mr. Cooper when you were young? Yes, I met him in Washington. So that would have been before your father moved to Gannett? Yes. Began working for mm -hmm. While your father joined Gannett Company Incorporated as executive assistant to Frank Gannett and was almost immediately perceived as the heir apparent to Gannett himself, your father's papers contained virtually no documentary evidence of professional jealousy on the part of any of Miller's colleagues. Was your father actually hired specifically to succeed Gannett? Yes, he was. And were his colleagues really as welcoming and magnanimous as the collection seems to indicate? Uh, I think that um, he felt uncomfortable with them because uh, I think that, that there was one man that thought he was going to replace Frankinette when Frankinette passed away. Do you remember any of your father's co-workers from this time or whether your parents talked about any of them? Uh, yes, I do remember uh, several of them, and, uh, and they came to our house, and uh, I just think the first year or so, I think it took them a while to accept my father, and then he finally was accepted and well-liked and played golf with them, and, and everything was fine after about a year. Who, who were some of your parents' close friends during this time? Uh, he uh, played golf and met a lot of other people in Rochester just playing golf. And, uh, and I would say that he kept in touch with Frankinette for a number of years. Frankinette was 
living in Rochester, and uh, and one of the other founders of the Gannett Company also lived in Rochester. They kept in touch with him and his wife also, and uh, they they knew presidents of a lot of big companies like Kodak and. Uh, there were other big companies in Rochester, and Dad was asked to be on the board of some of the companies. And uh, they had a Paul Miller Day, and President Nixon used to come to Paul Miller Day, and that was when they would play golf in Rochester, and sometimes they'd play in Washington or other, at other clubs. And I have pictures that were taken with Pre Nixon was a, 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 pre, a friend of Dad's from the time he was a congressman. They knew each other, and they'd met each other in Washington when we lived there, and so the friendship developed. And um, as, I, as I recall, the Nixons lived in Spring Valley quite a while, too, and that was where we lived in Washington, a suburb. And so he did play a lot of golf with Nixon, and he was very upset because of uh, what happened with President Nixon. He didn't, he was just shocked about that, and because he thought he was a good man, and so um, it was hard on, I think it was hard on him, but, uh, but most of Dad's friends were on us, so that was good. Were your parents close with, with people from the neighborhood that weren't necessarily part of his professional circle? Yes, my mother, uh, we knew the people who lived across the street very well. And, um, and we, uh, yes, when I'd go back to visit, I met, my parents sold off some of their property and because they had 24 acres in 1947, but then they gradually sold it off and houses were built in the area there and so they got to know all of the neighbors and they they'd get together and have parties at each other's homes and so it, it was a lot nicer after we had neighbors because we didn't have neighbors for quite a while when we were growing up we didn't have close neighbors except the coolies who lived across the street and he was a doctor in Rochester and we knew they had family so, um, you know, we used to walk up to, the, to Clover Street and get the bus up there, the school bus, and it went on a big circuit into the country, and um, there were farmer's children that would ride the bus, and I remember one boy saying, you live in such a big house, how come you have that big house? And, and I don't remember what I said, I was just kind of surprised what he would say, but that was elementary school where a lot of children are very honest with each other. And uh, so uh, it was just a different way of life in Washington. And uh, I, I did uh, go to Boston. You know, I told you before about going to Boston to college for two years, and then I was back in Rochester teaching preschool for a year. and. So I, I moved there when I was nine, so I really only lived there for nine whole years. So I think that the formative years were uh, there, but also in, in Washington. I, I have a lot of good memories. Based on his papers, your father's responsibilities at Gannett seem to have much more to do with public relations that is, with Gannett's publishing empire, Rochester's civic affairs, New York state politics, etc., than with the actual mechanics of publishing, reporting, and editorializing. Is this a fair appraisal of his new responsibilities at Gannett, or is it merely a reflection of the letters and clippings that survive in the collection? Uh, yes, I think he was very involved in civic affairs and went to luncheons and dinners and and um, I remember that um, 
uh, when we moved there, he went to a, a lot of dinners because there were fundraisers for Israel. Israel wanted to become a country, a nation, and there were a lot of Jewish people, and Dad would be invited to, to these fundraisers and did, you know, try to help with that to cause, and, and then Israel... Uh, they finally raised enough money to become a country or a nation. But I'm sure that, I, I think Dad probably helped in, with that. While I realize you might not have a sense of the details of your father's work once he moved to Gannett, how do you remember his day-to-day -day schedule and workload changing with this new position vis-a-vis -vis from the Associated Press to Gannett? Uh, the fact that he seemed busier and was on the Gannett plane a lot and going around to the other newspapers and um, he was very busy. He was uh, he was the editor of the evening paper, the Rochester Times Union, but he was considered the publisher of both newspapers, the morning newspaper, the Democrat and Chronicle, and then the Times Union. So he. He was very involved with the local newspapers also, in addition to checking on the other newspapers and making sure they were doing a good job. Which man would your father have said had a more significant impact on his life, Kent Cooper or Frank Gannett? That's hard to say. Uh, Frank Gannett was in his 70s when Dad moved to Rochester. When we moved to Rochester, and uh, I think he respected him. I th he respected Frank and Ed, and uh, it, it's hard to say. Uh, we remained friends with Mrs. Gannett after Mr. Gannett died, and she even had a party for me, a big party at her house right before I was married in 1967. And we had moved there in 1947, and so we kept up the friendship with the family. And um, uh, I think that he respected both of the men equally. They were both good men, and, and uh, he, I think he had a lot of respect for Frank Gannett. From the time your father became president of Gannett Company Incorporated in 1957 until Alan Newharth took over in 1973, your father oversaw a vigorous expansion program. In general, do you think his principal motivations for such an expansion were journalistic or were they entrepreneurial? I think they were journalistic and entrepreneurial also because he had friends who were in the newspaper business and men who owned chains that he would see at American newspaper publishers meetings and other meetings and uh, the Associated Press Board when he was on there. He got to know a lot of people that way that were in the newspaper business and owned chains. And so I think it was a competitive thing, but I think he really enjoyed it also and, and he did want success for the Gannett Company. And so the Gannett Company did grow quite a bit while my father was president. You would have been headed to college when your father started as chief at Gannett. How much did you hear about your father's work while you were away? Uh, when, uh, when I was at Pine Manor College, Pine Manor Junior College, it's now Pine Manor College in Boston, um, I uh, found out that my father had been named president of the Associated Press Board, and he was already president of the Gannett Company, and his picture was on the cover of Time magazine while I was in Boston because of the fact that he had those two well-known positions, and it gave his background in an article, and, and, uh, and of course, newspapers, it was in a lot of newspapers also when he became president of the Associated Press Board, and it was because he was the first former AP employee to become president of the board, and that was the main topic. 
when they put it in the newspapers and on the on the news, on the radio and TV. Do you have any sense of how things changed for him in these new positions? Uh, I just think he was got busier and busier all the time, and I think his release was playing golf <laughs> when he could, and uh, so uh, I think he loved the newspaper business first. So that was that was paramount and. And as I said before, he and my mother would read newspapers at night, so it wasn't just during the day that he was busy with the newspaper business. Your father knew every president from Franklin Roosevelt to Jimmy Carter, three Republicans and five Democrats, and he was particularly close to Richard Nixon and uh, Lyndon Johnson, particularly Nixon. Although he was a lifelong Republican and conservative, in what ways did his political philosophy differ from the hyper-partisanship of our own time, or did it? Um, I don't think it really differed that much, and I think he was uh, kind of like President Reagan and and, Ab and Ab if, if he was to say who his favorite president was, I think he really thought a lot like President Reagan thought. So his his Reaganomics. His, his conservative and Republican views, did did they affect his his feelings about or his friendships with uh, President Johnson and President Kennedy, for example, or President Truman? Uh, no, as far as I know they didn't talk about who was who and who was the Democrat and who was the Republican. I don't think that that no, I think he tried to be by uh, is the word bipartisan? Mm -hmm. uh, because he, I think you feel more relaxed if, if you um, don't talk about uh, what your, uh, you know, how you feel about it. I think he just, I think being a good reporter is really to interview somebody and get what you can out of that person and not um, give your views so much. So and he I, didn't I, let his personal uh, political philosophy interfere with his uh, reporting or journalism. Uh, no, I don't think he showed that he was biased. If he was, if he thought that he, if he was biased, he didn't let people know that. Let famous people didn't know it. What stories do you remember hearing from him about some of the presidents that he worked with or interviewed or knew? Um, well, he, he and my mother went on a Gannett plane down to see LBJ in uh, Oklahoma. I mean, in Texas, not in Oklahoma. And they went to the ranch, and, and LBJ had a big old Cadillac convertible, and he drove him around. He drove them around uh, all over the ranch on these bumpy roads. <laughs> so my mother <clears throat> especially remembered that, and Dad thought it was great that Johnson wanted to show his property and uh, because he was, Dad was from Oklahoma and, and Johnson was from Texas, I think they, they got along even though their politics weren't the same. They, get, they got along real well. Your father's editorials show that he was a lifelong fiscal conservative but he also served as president of the Associated Press and Gannett during one of the most tumultuous periods of social change in the history of the United States. What were his views of the cultural revolution with respect to racial equality, uh, and there's others, women's rights, the Vietnam War, campus protests, and the sexual revolution? It's hard to say. Um... I can't really tell you uh, how he felt. I, I just don't know. Was he appalled at the social changes that, that were occurring during the 60s or the, in the 70s? Did he share those feelings? Uh, he never, uh, no, he never really complained about it. And uh, I, uh, no, I don't remember him being upset about it at all. Uh, and when you talk about the Cultural Revolution, are you talking about China? 
No, no, the Cultural no. Revolution in the United States, the, uh -huh. the, uh, the, the civil rights movement uh, uh -huh. of the 60s and 70s, uh, women's rights, the women's rights movement, uh, the Vietnam War, campus protests against the war, and, and uh, uh -huh. the sexual revolution that, that occurred during the 60s and 70s. Uh, I can't really uh, reply to that. I just don't know. Do you have any sense that his personal views may have been different from the ones that some of the Gannett papers espoused? Uh, I know that there was an uprising in Rochester with the blacks, and, uh, and they thought my dad was biased, and, um, and it was partly because of what some of the other people who worked for the Rochester newspapers were writing in articles. and. Um, and so there was a problem at that point, and, uh, but there were uprisings in other cities around the United States at the same time. I know that Dad was not uh, against uh, equality for everyone, and he, uh, when he was growing up, he had a very good uh, friend who was an Indian in high school because they lived on an Indian reservation in Oklahoma, and uh, and so he went to school with Indians and and uh, remained stayed in touch with the one man who was a good friend in high school. So there wasn't. I don't. I think he believed in racial equality, just partly because of that background, and because of his father being a minister. And uh, so I, uh, you know, he certainly wasn't a racist. Let's put it that way. And and you know how I told you that he would kid about being one eighth Chippewa, and uh, and I think my mother. <laughs> Back then, it wasn't it wasn't as socially acceptable, and nowadays, you know, you you say you're part Indian if you are. And I've told people I'm a member of the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution, and so I told people at one of the meetings that I thought I was part Cree Indian, and two other women spoke up, and and one is uh, Cherokee. She's part Cherokee. And another, the other one, I can't remember, you know, what her background is, but it's something that in my, when my mother was growing up, you, there was more racism and you didn't, you didn't say, I'm part Indian. So that was a big joke and fun for dad because he could say he was one eighth Chippewa and mother would say, oh no, you aren't. So that was, that's the difference is, <laughs> Uh, and my mother grew up in Columbus, Ohio, and lived there all of her life. And and I don't think, you know, in Oklahoma, there are a lot of Indians, too. And in Ohio, that's not the case. You know, you just didn't see Indians so much. And so um, it's the cultural revolution, I think, is something that's, you know, we all accepted it, and that's, a, that's all I can say about it. Alan Newharth titled his autobiography, Confessions of an SOB. Mm -hmm. And from your father's papers, it seems that they might have had a somewhat conflicted relationship. What were your father's feelings with respect to Al Newharth in 1963 when your father first hired him? Um... I think that Dad thought Al was a good worker, and um, they had a good relationship. And uh, I don't remember. I know that Al was divorced while he was living in Rochester, and we, I know my parents liked his wife, and they were upset about that. And. Uh, I think he was very different than my father was, and uh, but he he did. Al Newhart started USA Today, and Dad was proud of the fact that it did become 
a successful newspaper. It was it struggled for a few years. They were in the red for a while, but that was that was Al Newhart's big achievement. And uh, and socially, uh, after he was divorced, uh, my parents really didn't see Al Newhart that much, but. Um, that it was always a business relationship. It wasn't as social as some of the other friendships and relationships. How did your father feel about uh, Al Newhart after the latter became Gannett CEO in 1973? I think that they approved of just about everything that he did. I, yes, I think that uh, that that Dad was pleased with everything. Your father retired in 1979. What do you remember about his decision at that time? Uh, he, he became chairman of the board at that point and he was put in charge of acquisitions. So he wasn't really retired, uh, but that was really, well, he, he, I shouldn't say it that way. He really, uh, yeah, he really was, he really was put away kind of when, when he retired, and uh, he went to board meetings, and uh, I think that, you know, there comes a time when everybody needs to retire, although Dad loved the newspaper business, but he kept up his friendships with newspaper people, and uh, and I... I should say that, no, he, he was not in charge of acquisitions then. And I can't remember what year he became, I think when he became chairman of the board, and I've forgotten what year that was, this is when he became in charge of acquisitions and board, and more newspapers were bought. And then uh, he did have a stroke uh, soon after he retired and they were living in Florida and started living in Florida year round but uh, not year round, but half of the year, but sometimes more than half of the year. And then they'd go to Rochester for the summer. And uh, so I think they were pleased with Al Newhart's, uh, the way he ran the company. What were your parents' plans for retirement? And um, I think that, uh, that they thought about uh, uh, he may be living in just one place, but they did keep two homes. They kept their home in Pittsburgh, and they had bought a home in Palm Beach, Florida, in the 19, uh, it was 1960s that they bought a home there. And they rented it out part of the time because they weren't down there very much. And uh, I mean, for a number of years, they rented it out and then started going there more often. And so that was their lifestyle. Were there particular things that they wanted to do during their retirement? Dad liked to play golf, and, and even after he had a stroke, he did continue to play golf. I read that. Mm -hmm. What did your mother do in the years following your father's death? Did she move? Was she diff involved in, in different activities? Uh, she actually played a lot of bridge. Uh, after her children left home, and uh, she loved gardening, and, and she continued to do gardening and play bridge after my father passed away. How do you think your parents would want to be remembered as a couple and individually? Uh, I think they were very good uh, for each other business-wise with his business and also socially, they were good. Uh, they, uh, I think they, they knew how to deal with people and I think they were successful. What do you think is your father's greatest legacy? I think that uh, uh, that his greatest legacy might be that uh, that you should do the right thing, and uh, and 
that, that that you should not have that there should not be biased reporting, which is not true anymore. There is a lot of biased reporting because people um, seem to look for that. I think uh, they like uh, they like to hear different viewpoints. Let's put it that way. It's it's different than it used to be, but I think that. Um, Yeah, I, th I think that that printing uh, the news and uh, giving all the facts and, uh, is something that we don't, it's not as good reporting nowadays, I don't think, as it used to be. But it's, uh, you have to do a lot of in-depth reading to really get the whole story. And, uh, I think that that the, I think he, he just loved being a reporter and that that was, his legacy was, was trying to be a good reporter. He certainly was. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to discuss? Uh, no, I can't think of anything right now. Well, Ms. Gordon, I thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and feelings with us and uh, we're gonna conclude the interview at this time. Okay.